So the uh, next session we have in this track is uh, uh, by Jim uh, Trier speaking about 10 design tips for microservices developers. What to you, Jim? There we go. I assume you can hear me. Yes, we can. We can. And then I'll share my window. And I assume you can see my screen, and I can see that I'm sharing my screen. So I think we're good to go. All right. Hey, good awesome. morning. Good. Yep. Uh, all right. Let's uh, get this thing going, and we'll do our best to keep this thing on track uh, for those uh, watching at home. Hey, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Jim Tyrell. I'm a senior principal solutions architect here at Red Hat. Uh, I've been here almost 15 years, been in our public sector sales practice that entire time. I'm also 25 years a Java coder. And this talk is 10 design tips for microservices developers. Uh, this isn't going to speak on any uh, particular uh, technology per se, but it's going to give you some high level things to think about as you're creating microservices. And actually, as you watch this talk, you probably will see that these things apply to other software development you are doing. At the end of this, I will invite you to a workshop I'm doing at the end of the month, which will be kind of a follow on to this thing where I actually will get into some code, some thinking around how to do domain driven development in the context of microservices a little bit of emphasis on Quarkus and Java. So uh, just something outside of this uh, presentation stream, if you will, that'll be uh, an invite at the end of this. So uh, development and design, I, I believe, sits at the intersection of science, art, methods, and patterns. Uh, I am the founder of Design for Developers, just a website if you want to go check it out. It's where some of my writings are for this on social media. I'm known as the design Uh If you didn't know it, here at Red Hat, we've published a, a library we call Open Practice Library. This brings together a lot of design thinking tools. These are really great ideation tools with my master's degree at the Institute of Design in Chicago. I learned about many of these, I'm practiced with a lot of them. But at the end of the day, as a software developer, a lot of them just don't exactly speak to me when I'm writing code, when I'm trying to deliver systems. And because of that design thinking that I have, let me put this out there in the ecosystem. And one of the things that I absolutely love about software development is the fact that it brings together science, art, patterns, and methods, right? Every day, I'm excited to get up to sling code because of that intersection. And with my master's degree, I noticed that, especially the design program that I went to in Chicago, that design is about art, but it's also most certainly about patterns, methods, and science, right? And if you didn't realize that design is a science, it most certainly is. That is some of what I talked to at my website, designfordevelopers.io. Since I'm the son of a math teacher, uh, you can't have an equation like that without the transitive property. And that means that design is development and development is design. These two things are inter inescapably intertwined, almost like gravity. Uh, you as a software developer are making design decisions every day, yet sadly, you probably don't have a lot of design training in your background. And that's what this session is a little bit about. That's a little bit about what the Open Practice Library is certainly about. And then of course, the designfordevelopers.io website. And uh, this is a quote, something that I've put out there for a long time, right? Unless you are impossibly lucky, and sometimes I say unlucky, all software at some point will be consumed by humans, for sure during its development, but also for the years after it was delivered as it will be maintained and may continue to be used by humans. In other words, if you're familiar with the mythical man month, all the cost of software is in its maintenance. Uh, if you're putting software for any length of time, right? You as a developer, if you come back to something a year from now, you're, you know, I've seen jokes on Facebook and other memes that, you know, who wrote this thing? And when you figure out it was you, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a challenging endeavor. Certainly, it's one of the more complicated things we will do as humans. One of the things that I've spoken about and think about is the user interface notion of software, right? And I think there's at least three and, you know, this talk in prior people have talked about test cases, documentation. But I think for us as software writers, we're responsible for any one of these three user interfaces, right? And obviously it's a GUI graphical user interface that is most certainly gonna be there. Uh, your API is code, right? The methods, functions, variables, et cetera, that you uh, deliver are most certainly gonna impact the user interface for those end users. And then what, where this talk kind of gets into and, and thinking about a little bit is the API is a service as a user interface, right? And as we're throwing around JSON objects at URLs, most certainly those are user interfaces to someone uh, at some point, you know, even if this, the machines go off and do that heavy lifting for a long time, 
more, more than likely us as humans are going to have to deal with that writing and interaction with that at some point and thinking about the human along the way will pay huge dividends. Uh, one of the things that I, I brought up in this talk is the five E's. This comes from uh, a Doblin talk, uh, a, a great firm out of the Chicago area in my design community with my master's program. It came about in a uh, what predated TED Talks in 1997. I'm assuming you've probably never heard of this. You'll notice I crossed out the word great and I crossed out the word curated in this. Organically, every experience you have, no matter what it is, including this talk, will organically absolutely have a state of inter engaging and exiting. In other words, you will most certainly enter the experience, you will work within it, and then you will leave it. And I would argue that that's just an experience and that's just organic and you're not managing the emotions or any state of that user along the way. The five E's though adds one thing at the beginning and one thing at the end that I think we as software developers don't do a great job of. So the first one in this, and I would argue that every great curated experience has these five steps and you are consciously thinking about them as you're creating your microservices. Right, you want to think about how you're going to bring in people into your universe, whether that's a README on a GitHub page, uh, advertising because you're looking to sell this these services out in the wild, maybe webinars or lunch and learns internally. But somehow you need to make people aware of what it is that you're delivering and give them confidence that you can help solve the problems that they are that your solution will provide for them. You also need to think a little bit about how they're going to enter this experience. What is that demarcation or what is that start line, if you will? for when they get into that experience. You know, you need to think about, as I talked about the engagement, right? What are they doing in there? What are you doing to remove friction toil and invisible work, which is a term I like to put out there a lot around design in the context of software. Of course, those users are going to exit it. And most importantly, and probably the most important thing to think about to really create a great experience is how do you extend that experience for that end user? We're gonna go through a few things to think about as we work our way through this talk. If you notice at the bottom middle of this page, there is entice is in there. So we are still at the enticement step of, step of this talk. I'm still trying to bring you into this, uh, this, this uh, narrative, if you will. And we're looking to, uh, to bring you along on this journey, right? And the other thing to think about is that all journeys should have consistency. So certainly at the macro sense, you wanna think about these five steps, but you probably also wanna think a little bit about these at the micro sense, right? So at the macro sense, let's say you want to send emails to the world, right? You're going to be like Twilio or any number of other services that are out there in that space that do that. But along the way, when people are looking to deal with an API, what are you doing to bring them into a specific use case within that? So that's what I'm speaking to when I ask you to think about all experiences having consistency. Uh, you know, like all good designers, all good software people, right? We should Google around and find what other things exist uh, in the past around this. Again, another thing from 1997 from Nelson Norman Group. These are just luminaries in the design field. Don Norman is very famous. Uh, a couple books that are off on my bookshelf here to the left. But this is a great list, but it really spoke to lowercase d designers of, of colors, fonts, layouts, and things like that. I mean, it, it definitely speaks a little bit to a software developer, but it just didn't quite resonate with me. So, you know, like everything, when there isn't a good standard in software, you know, what we should do is go create another standard uh, just to prolifer proliferate those across the ecosystem. So I came up with this uh, list. It started with just a few S's and I just decided to do the whole thing in S. We're gonna drill into each of these uh, here in a second. And I, I hope and think that you will have a, a good list of things to check off as you're thinking about your software. So with that, let's cross that start line, let's uh, enter this talk. So let's get into 10 design tips from microservices developers. So the first one is avoiding doc debris, right? And as you're bringing people into your experience, you really wanna think about what you're gonna do to help them with uh, getting rid of or creating anti-quick starts, right? That's what's out in the world. The wall of intertwined text, the challenge of missing steps. And then the last one I call back and forth, right? So anti-quick starts, I'm amazed that today in 2021, in August, I still get to quick start pages that literally have hundreds of steps for me to do, tens of pages to navigate. And I have no idea how I could possibly do all those things perfectly and accurately along the way to get started with something. Uh, you know, I think that just speaks for itself. The wall of intertwined text, intertwined text is uh, probably one of my biggest pet peeves in this documentation game, right? We have. Windows, Linux, and Mac OSs are the tools of choice of people that write software. 
inevitably our instructions might start out great with telling us what to do exactly for these three operating systems. When you get to step two, they might just document the Linux and Windows uh, instructions and hope you'll figure out what you should do for your Mac. And then you get to your third step and you're left wondering, well, what do I do on Windows or Linux? And the worst thing about these steps is that these things are never labeled step one, two, and three. There's usually just a huge long checklist of things to do. The different OSs are interchanged with each of these instructions and more than likely you're gonna fail because you're gonna miss the fact that you needed to do this one nuanced thing along the way. Another one, right? The internet meme of uh, question marks and profit in step four, right? Missing steps along the way. Uh, please don't leave your, your users with question marks about what gaps they need to fill in to run uh, your project or your service, right? You should be able to give people the ability to just quickly get started with your service. And we'll get to those with the nine items of assessment here in just a little bit. And this is uh, the one where probably you live in day in and day out as you're running, the most certainly deploying software, right? And this is uh, what I've called the back and forth, this idea that you're gonna have certain pages of documentation that you're gonna have open. You're gonna go track down another guide from somewhere else. You're gonna open up a stack overflow page. And then you probably have some notes written down from the last time you did this. You're going to print, bring all four of these open on your monitor or across your desktop. Try to put those all together to deliver an experience for yourself to get something installed. You know, I would my friendly ask is that for these four things to just think about your end users and think about your future self uh, as you have to come back to this maybe in a year to figure out what it takes to deliver the software. So let's get to those uh, nine purpose-defining statements or what I call assessment at this point. So security over slyness, right? As, and notice that this is kind of enticing your users in. As you're bringing people into your experience, you really want to think about what you're doing around security, right? Are you using TLS, HTTPS? Are, are and what are the rules around password management? What are you doing around tokens and keys and how they should be stored or not stored? Uh, do they Are they one-time use and then they're hidden from use for you forever? or can I go recover them? Do they time out if I don't use them for 30 days or five hours and are they gone forever if I don't ever use them? Do they time out if I don't use them for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, right? What are the rules around data at rest and or in flight? You know, in our the government space that I hang out in, we, we talk about FIPS encryption, encryption 140-2, soon to be 140-3. And these are just some of the things you should think about in the context of security over slyness and you don't wanna have security by obscurity. Uh, one of the things that I had uh, that happened to me just a few months ago when I was playing with the service, uh, downloaded a software key, uh, tried to use it a month or two later, didn't get any success with that key. It was kind of like, hey, what's going on here? Uh, thought to myself, well, let's go get a new one. Got a new software key, uh, went and used it and the code worked without any changes other, other than that software key. It would have been great if the documentation, when I downloaded that key, it told me, hey, dummy, that thing's gonna expire in just a few hours or a few days, whatever the rule is. I actually have no idea what the rule is. I just was caught up in it. And uh, you know, that creates some friction for me as an end user. Scaling over shattering, right? We're living in this web-enabled world with mobile devices where you know it's not unheard of to have hundreds of thousands of users hit your app uh, if something happens that brings a lot of people to you. Uh, at the same time, you also want to think about disaster recovery and high availability, right? What are you thinking about your services to keep them up and running on the, under the face of increasing pressure? What are you doing around things like Knative, serverless, functions as a service, OpenShift, Kubernetes, containers, and other building blocks to give you easy ability to scale up and scale out uh, horizontally the software that you're running in your organization? What are you doing around the saga pattern and item potency so that services can just keep being invoked until something happens, letting your user uh, be able to just keep on firing requests at your services? And most importantly, what are you doing to bend but not break, right? It's one thing to have a slow experience. It's a whole nother experience to get the white screen of death, which is always, always a bad thing for your end users. We'll talk about that here in just a few seconds. Support over stumbling, right? Going back to that Dr. debris question of earlier, what are you doing to provide your users a getting started experience? How can they self-start with that experience? How can they get started? Or do you require them to give you a credit card or you know, way more than a password or way more than an email address and a password, right? What can they be, what can you give them to be successful as quickly as possible? I'll talk a little bit about uh, documentation getting started experiences here in a bit, but what are you doing to get them to be successful as quickly as possible? What are you doing to make them superheroes as fast as possible? 
and what can you do to facilitate that for them and your end users? So here's an example, right? I'll pick on the guys at Twillow uh, since I gave them a little bit of a shout out earlier, sort of. Uh, so I wanted to send as part of a proof of concept uh, a few months ago, a text message, right? And a text message on your phone, pretty simple, right? Your phone has your phone number on it. You then pick your friend that you're sending your text message to, and then you send them the, um, uh, the text message, right? Download this code from uh, their uh, getting started examples. Uh, went in there, signed up for a phone number, gave them my phone number, activated my phone number as a message uh, receiver of text messages from this account, ran that code, and wouldn't you know it that my phone number was not valid in the context of this example. And you would think, or at least I would think, that matching the real world going to that Nelson Norman list of uh, earlier would be an important thing, right? And just thinking about how I use my phone, right? A phone has the phone number it is, and the message and the two phone number are together. But you go look at the doc, docs for this, and it's actually not that case, right? The actual, the two phone numbers first, the farm phone number's in the middle, the string is there at the end. You know, these are the kind of things that drive users crazy, a little bit of that friction, uh, toil, and invisible work. Standardization over straying, right? Uh, I, I think, well, this is an example out of the Swagger docs in the Spring Pet Store. I'm not exactly convinced that the updated existing pet semantics on the left-hand side match the semantics on the right-hand side. Uh, I would actually argue that that put example of updating a pet should probably have the pet ID on the URL. Uh, the other semantics of some of those other ones in there are updating a pet or deleting a pet. And I just think that having that URL have that pet ID in there makes me feel a lot better about the way this looks and feels from an end user perspective. I also think it gets you thinking at least a little bit about the difference of creating a pet on the left-hand side and updating a pet on the right and changing the nomenclature of what it is that you're passing around and not making any mistakes, you as an end user human. Of course, this gets to get to my next uh, big headache in this is what is ID in this example, right? Is it a capital I and D, a capital I, a lowercase d? If you look at the documentation here, right, the curly brackets have a uppercase I, a lowercase d, and then the words say find pet by ID, all caps uh, there in the blue get. And of course, as you go on, you know, there's an XML markup around this that's going on with this and an example of ID. So which ID should it be, right? Should it be lowercase, should it be uppercase? Uh, I would also say these three IDs here should probably be fully qualified. How many times have I spent some time debugging something just because you crossed up the same word in the same way across different classes or whatnot? I would argue that this should be pet ID, category ID, and tag ID keeping the world a little bit easier for your future self when you're trying to debug or just figure out what's going on as you're decoding these things. I would also argue and, and add that I think ID should always be capital I, capital D, full stop, that's it, done, end of story. If you disagree, put that in the chat and uh, feel free to argue with me when this talk is over. So sense over subbing, right? Uh, this is this idea that as users engage with your software that they have the time and the uh, prompts to do what are the next best steps are, and you're not requiring them to have huge amounts of training or knowledge. And one of the questions or examples I always put out there, are your end users airplane pilots or nuclear power plant operators, or are they the trainers of those who, who is actually you as a software developer? You actually could train the pilots or the nuclear power plant operators of your offering if that is indeed what you are shipping. At the end of the day, I think most of us are just Homer Simpson, right? We are trying to deliver software or use this software once a quarter, once every six months, maybe once a year. There are very few things that we will do that require the type of training that a nuclear power plant operator or airplane pilot, uh, pilot undergo for an event that probably will never happen to them. And of course, that begets the question, what happens when a nuclear power plant operator is Homer Simpson? And thankfully, that's a question for another day. Uh, <laughs> so we'll leave that one alone. Safety over setback, right? As your users are engaging with this, what are you doing to allow them to undo things? What are you doing around eventual consistency, item potency, again, thread safety? What are you doing to allow them to be safe in the use of your offering? Do you give them a sandbox? Do you allow them to play? Do you allow them with immutable architecture or infrastructure to you know just throw away everything that they did with a database instead of touching anything? What kind of rules do you have around how people touch uh, development systems versus production systems, and how do you keep all that safe? What are you doing around test cases around all those things? All right, just some of the things that you need to think about in the context of this. And, uh, you know, my big ask is error messages. You know, think about the fact that your end users do not have the terminal 
access that you had while you were de de developing that microservice? What are you giving them when they interact with your microservice in a browser or with Postman or some other tool to let them know that something did not go correctly? What are you doing to validate that input? What are you doing to let them know that something didn't validate or you know words are crossed up? You know, uh, and the last point here is a white screen of death is never okay. You should never not return at least something to the end user to at least let them know that something is up and running and available at that endpoint. Uh, stewardship over suffering for that long-term user, you know, somebody who has invested some time to play with you. What are you doing to make them great at what they do? What are you doing to document the middle, the thick middle use case of the bell curve of what they're trying to do? Like a lot of examples, a lot of projects out there have some hello world simple getting started examples. They might also have every command line switch documented, but where those two kind of meet in the middle is you know, not really documented, might not really be tested all that much, and it just drives end users nuts and crazy. Uh, my friendly ask would be, what are you doing around observing your users and removing friction, toil, and visible work for them? I challenge you, I implore you, go out, watch your users, use your brand new software, people that have never touched it in the past, be quiet, listen to what they're telling you about what's going on and just see what, what they can tell you about what they are struggling with. Status over surmising, right? At the end, you wanna make sure that as you're exiting the user that they have a clear ending. You're letting them know that something has occurred, that they have finished up. You might give them some stats about what it is that they uh, accomplished. You definitely wanna do some metrics gathering. You definitely wanna grab some logging. You definitely wanna gather information for the next step, which is statistics and study over speculation. Right. As your end user is finishing up this, what can you email them to let them know about what it is they accomplished? How are they comparing to others in your use cases and your user bodies? What are you doing to follow up with them about what it is that they accomplished? What can you do to make their experience easier and lighter weight? And the last thing I'll talk about there is user interviews and surveys. And this is a, a vendor, a nameless vendor from a friend of mine a few months ago when I was snowboarding with them. And they were using a new cloud service in the NoSQL database space. And uh, they were in a beta program and the tooling told the product manager that, hey, this person was having some problems. He got an email from them and didn't even realize that this could, should happen. Uh, the guy asked, hey, can we speak to you about your challenges or our efforts? And he said, sure. Uh, they came together, had a meeting. The, the program product manager brought the program manager and a developer. They met on a Tuesday. My friend showed him in screen sharing some of the headaches and, and, and problems he was having along the way. Later on that week, that vendor had fixed those problems. When was the last time you were able to both watch and talk to a user of your software and be able to fix that bug challenge or friction point in near real time? Very, very powerful. So let's just in conclusion, let's just uh, kind of wrap through this, right? You wanna avoid dock debris. You wanna make sure that you have security over obscurity and security over slyness. You wanna make sure that you can stand up to web scale type traffic and workloads. You want to make sure that your net new user doesn't have to stumble all over the place. They can figure out what's going on organically or very simply. You definitely want to think about how you're going to standardize over these things, right? You want to standardize on ID and words and nouns and all the words that go around your system so there's some uh, consistency across the entire ecosystem of your services. For your long-term users, you definitely want to give them the idea that they can sense the next best action. They don't need to summon from the depths of knowledge what it is they're doing or trying to. Uh, to deal with. Safety over setback, you really wanna think about how your end users can use your product safely and not get themselves into any trouble. What are you gonna do for your long-term users to let them know and, and discover what it is they could do and give them some deeper examples and documentation or use cases or test cases they can peruse to learn more about. Uh, over time, you definitely wanna gather what information is available for your users. You don't wanna just guess and assume that people are doing things a certain way. You wanna actually see it with your own eyes. And as time goes on, you definitely wanna gather real world feedback from your end users and see what's going on there. So at the end, these 10 design tips for microservices developers give you a framework to help you remove friction, toil, and invisible work. Uh, you will make your users smarter when you take away their friction, toil, and invisible work. That's definitely a talk for another time. And please come meet me out at designfordevelopers.io and I'll have a workshop that I'm gonna call 10 more design tips for microservices developers with some Java and Quarkus thrown in. That's at the end of the month. You can uh, register that at a link I'll put in the chat here in a second. And please feel free to reach out to me and all those fun little links up there, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Feel free to uh, set up a meeting to meet with me if you'd like and uh, or see this workshop in a month.
and I will put a link to these slides in the chat also. And with that, we're almost sort of back on time. I gave you guys back a minute or two. And if you all have any questions, feel free to put that in the chat or the Q&A. Thank you very much.